Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Stranger Things books panel. Can you all hear me okay through the mask? Good? Okay. Uh, I am Keith Clayton. I am the uh, publishing director for Random House Worlds, which is our uh, licensed program of publishing at Penguin Random House, where we do a number of Stranger Things books, uh, many of which we'll be talking about today. Um, and without further ado, I will start introducing our panelists. Uh, first, we have Jody Hauser. Jody decided she wanted to be a writer when she was eight years old and never looked back. For better or worse, no one ever suggested that she stop. She earned her MFA in creative writing at Emerson College in Boston, where she, <laughs> where she completed her master's thesis in screenwriting and was a winner of the Rod Parker Fellowship for Playwriting. Starting in 2006, Jody began experimenting with webcomics. She is the creator behind the webcomic Cupcake Pow, which launched in 2010 and is currently available on Comixology Submit. Jody has written Faith for Valiant Comics, Max Ride, Ultimate Fight, and Agent May for Marvel, and Orphan Black for IDW. She has been a contributing writer to numerous comics anthologies, including Avengers No More Bullying, Vertigo CMYK Magenta, and both woman womanthology series. Uh, and lately, or most lately, she is the author of the Stranger, Stranger Things Science Camp series. Welcome, Jody. <laughs> Next to Jody, we have Sui Davies, who is an award winning Nigerian author of fantasy, science fiction, and general speculative fiction. He has published various novels for adults, the latest of which is Son of the Storm from Orbit, uh, and it's the first of an epic fantasy trilogy called The Nameless Republic. The second book in that series is forthcoming next year. His debut novel, David Mogo, God Hunter, won the 2020 Nomo Award for Best Speculative Novel by an African. He has also published works for younger audiences, uh, such as Stranger Things, Lucas on the Line, which comes out next week, Minecraft, The Haven Trials, and contributed to the instant number one New York Times bestselling anthology, Black Boy Joy. His shorter works have appeared in various periodicals and anthologies and have been nominated for various awards. Suyi is an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Ottawa in Ontario, where he currently lives. As a speaker and instructor, he has taught writing at the college level and spoken at various venues, institutionally and publicly. He earned his MFA in creative writing at the University of Arizona. Welcome, Suyi. <laughs> Adam Christopher, New York Times bestselling author of Empire State, which was Sci-Fi Now's Book of the Year and a Financial Times Book of the Year. Uh, Adam is the author of Made to Kill, Standard Hollywood Depravity, and Killing is My Business. Adam's other novels include Seven Wonders, The Age Atomic, and The Burning Dark. Author of official tie-in novels for the Netflix phenomenon Stranger Things, which some of you may have heard of, <laughs> The hit CBS television show, Elementary, and the award-winning Dishonor video game franchise, Adam is also the co-creator of the 21st century incarnation of Archie comic superhero, The Shield, and has contributed prose fiction to the world of Greg Rucka and Michael Lark's Lazarus series from Image Comics. Adam is also a contributor to the internationally best-selling Star Wars from a Certain Point of View anniversary anthology series, and has written for the all-ages Star Wars adventures comic from IDW. His debut Star Wars novel, Shadow of the Sith, was published in June 2022 and was an instant New York Times bestseller. Welcome, Adam. And last but not least, we have Reginald James, who is an actor, voice artist, and the commish fantasy sports writer. You can catch him currently as the voice of Blaze in the animated uh, battle between Image Comics' Radiant Black versus Blaze. His next audiobook project will be another addition to the Who HQ series with Who is Shaquille O'Neal. The Commish is a staff writer for Football Diehards, where you can catch his fantasy advice series, Ask the Commish and Commish HQ. Fantasy football fans can also find his work online at Fantasy Pros and Fan Sided Fantasy. Welcome, Reginald. So, yeah, so it's great. I mean, Welcome everybody, happy that uh, we can all be together. I know that you've all had a number of Stranger Things projects, and most recently, Lucas on the Line, which is coming next week. Adam Christopher wrote Darkness on the Edge of Town, which was a novel about Hopper, and Reginald is actually the voice narrator of the Lucas on the Line audiobook that's coming out next week. All right, 
So let's just jump into it. I had some questions for the group. Um, I would love to tell you, you know, I'd love to have you tell us, tell the audience a little bit about your latest book and also how you became involved with Stranger Things in the first place. We can go down the line, starting with Jody. Uh, so I'd already written a number of licensed books for Dark Horse Comics, who's the publisher of the Stranger Things books. So I'd worked on uh, Halo and StarCraft for them, and I've since worked on Critical Role. Um, so they came to me, and essentially an editor who I'd worked with previously reached out and was like, do you have any interest in writing Stranger Things comics? And I uh, could not hit reply fast enough on that. <laughs> Um, so I wrote the very first uh, Stranger Things comic, which was uh, collected in an edition called uh, The Other Side, and it tells Will's story during season one. So we see everything he had to do to survive in the Upside Down. There's sort of a few surprises where he maybe is the reason Nancy was able to get out, and she never knew, and fun details like that. Uh, and then I did two series that dealt with uh, some of the previous uh kids who were in the Hawkins lab and what happened with them. And then the most recent one that I wrote was Science Camp, which is basically Dustin meeting Susie, the start of that relationship, but also why is there maybe a murderer at camp? Because it's the <laughs> 80s and there's always a murderer at camp. Um, hi, everyone. So just like uh, Jody, I was also, um, I'd also like written time work prior to working with Stranger Things. Um, so I think I was on, um, I had done a Minecraft novel on the Penguin side. Uh, uh, Penguin Random House um, is called Minecraft The Haven Trials. And, and we had just completed that. And we had such an awesome time working on that team. Um, and I also had like my own original novels out at the time. And, and, and I think the Random House books for young readers were like, uh, who are like the publishers of the YA line, right? Of the Stranger Things novels. Uh, we're looking for someone to work on Lucas' story about engaging with that prior to season four starting. So they they were looking for someone and the folks at Penguin said, hey, we already worked with this guy and he was, he was like, awesome. So do you want to give him a shout? And they said, sure. And then they reached out to my agent and my agent said, hey, do you, are you interested in writing Stranger Things? And I'm like, interested? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? That's not a question. Um, and, and so, yeah, just like Jody, I couldn't like say, just don't ask questions, just take it. Um, and, and yeah, we had a sort of like a back and forth meeting. I met with some of the, um, the I met with the teams at Netflix uh, on the IP and also like uh, there were like a couple of writers from the writer's room of the season four show um and then we did like this um like a spec where because they told me all they wanted to do right they were, we we talked about the layers and what we wanted to explore especially with lucas where things are like very multi-layered in many ways um his relationships with the party with his girlfriend max um his relationships with like to himself and his family and being like one of the few black families in hawkins at the time um and also just like starting high school at the worst possible time when like there's been like this major disaster in town and they know how it happened. And so, yeah, there were many things and they wanted us to sort of like test the concepts. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I wrote a few of that. Um, they rejected like half of it, but um, it was it was fun because then they could see we were going in the same direction and they were like, all right, let's let's work on it together. So that's that's, that's how it came to fruition. Love it. Uh, before we go to Adam, just can we assume everyone in here has seen season four? Spoilers are okay at this point? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I got into Stranger Things through Star Wars. It's kind of backwards. My new book is Star Wars Shadow of the Sith, um, which just came out three weeks ago. But I've always wanted to write a Star Wars book. And I first met kind of the team at Del Rey uh, at San Diego Comic Con 2015, um, knowing that it's quite hard to get a Star Wars book because they don't do many and, you know, there's loads of people want to do them. So I just kind of hung around and just kept pestering them about Star Wars constantly, as you do, because, like, you have to hustle, right? <laughs> um, and it's, it's the same team that do the Star Wars books that did the adult Stranger Things books. 
at Delray. So this email just arrived. It's like, well, would you like to do a Stranger Things novel? And the only catch is it has to be Hopper's backstory. Just like, it's not a catch. That's like a, it's a hook. So I, yeah, I was like, of course. Um, I'd done elementary was my first tie-in stuff and I'd really enjoyed doing that. Because um, tie-in work is, it's quite high pressure and tight deadlines and you've got to do massive outlines because there's so many levels of approvals and stuff because it's obvious it has to. Um, so I'd kind of already, I'd done that elementary, two books and Dishonored, which is a video game series. I did three novels for that. So I was kind of, lucky to be in the position where they could just say to me, this is going to be Hopper's backstory where he's in New York in 1977. Go and write the story. Like, that was it. No restrictions, no requirements other than that was the story, uh, which is cool. So they left me alone and I, I wrote the book. Um, and the challenge of that book is Jim Hopper, the first time that he ever encounters the supernatural, the strange, is in season one of Stranger Things. So like, how did I, how can I do a book where it's set six years before he moves to Hawkins, but it's still a Stranger Things book because it like, it has him on the cover and Eleven and Stranger Things. And like, that's, that sets an expectation for a certain kind of story. So they kind of, I've, I've always done crime noir type stuff in my science fiction. So I think that's why they came to me because it's like, well, we need someone who's going to write, basically it's a, it's a supernatural cop book. Um, which is kind of cool. So, yeah, that's how I how I got into it. So, like Star Wars backwards. <laughs> Hello, um, I got on this crazy Stranger Things train because I had already done a couple of books for uh, Ping Penguin Random House, and uh, one of the producers said, "Hey, um, we want you to check this out. Take a look at it and send us something." And so I did, and uh, I got it. So, and yes, I was familiar. I, I had watched the, you know, the three seasons. This is four coming up. So I watched the three seasons. So I was already aware. And, uh, you know, so when I got it, I was like, yes. And then the second letter, I was like, oh, because I realized these are established characters. We've got crazy fans out here. And I'm like, oh, no, what did I say yes to? Um, so that's how I, that's how I got on, on this fast moving train. And Reginald, I, I mean, I believe you might have a little sneak peek handy for us of the Lucas on the Line audiobook. I do. Sui, I've got uh, a chapter two, an excerpt from chapter two um, from Mr. Sui Davies. And uh, I, can, I, can, I can give you a sneak peek. When is that, is that okay with y'all? It drops next week, next right? Week. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. Oh, there's some ling language. Okay, here we go. Uh, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Dustin's hair, which was already big, is now even bigger. Maybe because he isn't work. Maybe because he isn't wearing a hat to cover his curls this time. Without it, what he's done to his hair is very clear. He's blown up everything, trying to go for a mullet. It looks like a bad perm. <laughs> Good hair. Dustin says, the kind that gets you noticed for all the right reasons. Let me guess, you're taking advice from Steve Harrington again. <laughs> Who says it's Steve? Dustin pats his hair, as if that'll make it shorter or less curly. And so what if it's him? That'll explain why you look like a discount Jennifer Beals. Hey, I did everything like before, wash and condition with Fabergé Organis and I know, four puffs of Farrah Fawcett hairspray. Yes, you have explained this multiple times. It didn't work out for you at the snowball, and Tim Buck says it's not going to work out for you now. I shake my head. Man, you're seriously tripping. How can you not see that you're missing the most vital ingredient? Which is, you have to be born with the right hair in the first place, Dustin. <laughs> Dustin scoffs. Boop. Anyone can get good hair. Born with it or not, I just need more time. Yeah, maybe your definition of good hair is the problem, man. What's that supposed to mean? Never mind, I say. Well, you've made some changes too, he says, pointing to my bandana less head. Face it, we both know high school is brutal, and we're both trying to make sure we start on the right foot. 
Fair, I say. I'm just trying out a few changes, though not a whole makeover. A few indeed, says Dustin. This is as close to a makeover as you can get, Lucas. He leans forward and pats his hair again. Maybe it'll work out this time and girls won't sneer at us. He stops. Not like we're looking for girlfriends, of course. I've got Susie, Mike's got Elle, you've got Max. As soon as Dustin says her name, I realize I never spoke to Max about hanging out on the first day. It's been a while since we talked anyway. One more part of my life that needs fixing. Yeah, right, that, I say. Not sure Max and I are in the same lovey-dovey place you guys are, though. It's been weird with us since Starcourt. She's been weird. Weird is an understatement, really. The summer of the blade did a number on the whole party, even on the whole town. We're all still crawling our way back to normal. Not Max. Well, that sucks, says Dustin. I wish I could say I can relate, but I can't. He pauses for dramatic effect. Because you know, right, I've got a genius girlfriend. Yes, Dustin, we know. <laughs> Love it. I, it's, I can't wait to listen to the whole audiobook after that. <laughs> uh, so uh, I want to ask the author something that uh, Adam actually touched on a little bit in his, in his first response, which is, you know, one of the quirks of the Stranger Things series is that there usually can't be any supernatural attacks or any, you know, type of spooky events that happen between the seasons. So how do you make sure that your stories still feel like Stranger Things uh, working within those parameters? when you know you can't have a, you know, a demogorgon leaping out at everybody. Anyone want to take that one? I can start. Um, I, think, I think for me, one of the things I thought about to start was um, the relationship between characters is, carries a lot of the show, even if like the big action sequences are like exciting, right? And there's like really awesome effects. <laughs> um, but I, I think that's where I usually start. I'm like, what two characters have, you know, opposing goals, right? Or, or sometimes just um, that kind of scene, right? Where they're like sort of having this uh, uh, ping pong of, of uh, discussion, right? Um, and I think the other thing is I tend, I try to build the whole narrative out of like big moments or key moments that are not necessarily like supernatural related. Um, what what is important to this character? Um, in with Lucas on the line, what I was doing was, what are the things that are of like so much importance to Lucas that forces him to make changes that sort of land him at where he is at the beginning of season four, right? Because because by the beginning of season four, he has already made so many decisions that have brought him to this place, um, and that end is already known, right? Um, and where he left off at the end of season three is also known. So the real work is how do you how do you think about what those decisions and choices are? How do you make big you know like set piece um, scenes or moments out of those and then string them together to form a narrative that connects these two points? Um, so that's how I think about it first. And then sometimes, if you're lucky, like I was, you get some events that could be also, you know, um, could be catalysts in their way, even if they're not particularly part of the narrative. Um, so in this case, for instance, um, there were some events, which I can't mention, <laughs> um, <laughs> that were uh, of a supernatural leaning um, manner, <laughs> uh, that, were, that were of importance for some of the decisions that Lucas had to make um, about himself, about Max and stuff like that. So he, um, so even if a lot, of, a lot of the engagement was with like identity and like him trying to see if he could start afresh, right, with high school, try to be be a normal kid for once, not chasing monsters or like international spies or anything. Um, so I, I was like really trying to build big moments out of those. And then every time I got the opportunity to think about to or to engage or even sometimes draw parallels, right? Keep the overtone of this um, horror-ish show uh, or horror adjacent show. Um, so sometimes I would make like 
uh, comparisons between something or how something was like the Demogorgon or how high school high schoolers behave like the flayed because they have no minds of their own or whatever. Um, you know, so I would make those references just to keep the tone of the show in there, even if we're talking about something um, um, sort of relatively mundane. So in a way, um, I, I used all those things, right? Building those moments, stringing them together, keeping the overtone of the show and taking every opportunity to building some something supernatural adjacent into the narrative. Um, and, and in that way, yeah, we still get a Stranger Things book out of a relatively mundane events. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say to second that, like the character relationships are so core to why people love the show. I mean, sure, all the supernatural stuff is fun and scary and awesome. And the 80s stuff is nostalgic and cool. But if the characters weren't people we wanted to follow and see what's going to happen to them, I don't think most of us would really be watching. We'd be like, that was cool and tuned into something else. So for me, just like remembering that and trying to center that, whether supernatural stuff is happening or not, that's what makes it feel like stranger things to me. And to be fair, some of the stuff I've written has dealt with the supernatural, but you know, Dustin going away to science camp, he's at even not in Hawkins. So the stuff that would be happening in Hawkins, he's separated from. So it's things like finding out that even in the smart nerdy camp, they're still going to be bullies and they're just a different type of bullies than he's used to. And he's not with his normal friends. So he's weirdly more capable than some of these other kids at dealing with strange things happening on. And, you know, slashers aren't supernatural. They're just creepy people with weapons so that that doesn't count um and the one the one book i forgot to mention was a book i co-wrote with jim zub which is a stranger things and dungeons and dragons comic miniseries and that we focused on the kids relationship over the years and how D D from like when they started playing as younger kids before the show even starts up to uh, when will and eleven are going to be leaving and they play one last game to wrap up that campaign uh, and just how it sort of helped them cope with all the trauma, quite frankly, that they were going through and how it was still the glue that held that group together through everything. So just just finding those key points that are why we love these characters. Um, Darkness on the Edge of Town actually it came out before season three, I think. So... It sort of it links between seasons two and three. Stranger Things as a show has kind of changed over the four seasons. So when I was doing my book, it did really have to have that kind of supernatural feeling of Stranger Things. Um, I agree that the characters are really important and it has a framing device where it's Eleven and Hopper in their cabin, uh, snowed in at Christmas, and she brings out one of the boxes that we see in season two from under the floorboards, uh, which has New York on the side. So she brings it out and she's like, well, tell me the story of New York. And it's it was really an atmosphere type thing. So the book is set during the New York City blackout of 1977. So already it has a kind of weird quality. And Hopper, this is the book is set before his daughter dies. He's still married, before he moves to Hawkins. He's come back from Vietnam um, kind of like wanting to do something because like he volunteered for Vietnam. He wasn't drafted. So he was trying to like be special and be a hero. And he's come back to real life and moved from, because he's from Hawkins. So he's moved from Hawkins to New York in 1977, which is like the worst time you could possibly want to move to New York because he wants a challenge of, of like being a hero. But he's carrying that trauma of the Vietnam War. And the, the slight spoilers, if no one's read it, um, the evil villain that he faces kind of uses that against him. So throughout the book, we've got the blackout, we've got this kind of cult leader who was in the Vietnam War. Um, and Hopper doesn't know what's going on. Like, is this supernatural or is this guy just one of those charis strange charismatic cult leaders? Does he have mental powers over people or is it just that susceptible he's preying on susceptible people that then fall under his control so all through the book hopper's like this is like super weird is it supernatural or is it just real real um so it was it was a case of layering on the atmosphere and kind of like turning up the creepy factor which 
the seasons one and two of Stranger Things was a big feature of the TV show because um, it was very kind of plotty and upside down and dark fantasy. So I had to inject that into this book where, yeah, like I said, Hopper doesn't actually encounter genuinely, or does he, supernatural stuff in season <laughs> one. Like the villain in the book, is his name is St. John because he's like this this cult guy and like it's, uh, I think he has superpowers, but uh, through experimentation in the Vietnam War because he was part of like a super soldier program. Um, but Hopper is like, he's practical. He's a soldier. He's trying to do good and change his life and take control of his life. We all know how it falls apart when we meet him at the beginning of season one. Um, but at this stage, so he's like doing his job. He's a, he's a homicide detective in New York. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's it's the dark, what was called Dark Soldier Town. Right? So it's, it's kind of horror noir feeling atmosphere more than specifics the the vibe and it's also uh the name of the song that came out that year that the book is set which is a, a fun little tip. oh yeah bruce springsteen yeah i think he wears a bruce springsteen t-shirt at one point like like he's painting his house yeah um uh, yeah hopper said quite a life um so uh for you know for the authors and also for reginald uh you know who has been your favorite character to write and are there any characters that really surprised you with how much you enjoyed writing them and and I guess I would say for Reginald, favorite character to perform. Uh, well, I'll take the title character. I mean, I was really jacked up to get uh, an opportunity to to read as Lucas. And um, because he's a geek, I'm a geek, go geeks. And uh, <laughs> a lot of the things that he gets excited about, I get excited about. So typing, uh, tapping into that psyche was was pretty was pretty easy. Um, and I, I've got that kind of inter active energy too, so that was great. Um, I would say uh, Dustin was 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 hard for me to do, so that was challenging. I saw a Robin in here, but there's a Robin. She's she's gone, but there's a Robin in here. Uh, I like tapping into a Robin because they she she has come out a bit in the in the uh, current season, but when we first meet her, for all you fans, you know she was like. This cool, you know, she, she had a nice, she, she had a certain cool wiliness about her. So um, that was fun to do. But, you know, Lucas is my, uh, Lucas is my easy answer. It was fun, you know, reading with the type of energy that Caleb brings. I don't know Caleb, but I know what he does with Lucas. And I love that kind of energy. So that was really fun to tap into. And just the, the, the way, um, the 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 rhythm of the speech that was written by Sugi helps as well. So it made it made my job fun and really fun and easy. Um, I mean, for me, it was Jim Hopper because <laughs> this is like the amazing performance that we have from David Harbour made it so easy to translate that onto the page. And that's one of the things I love about writing, whether it's Star Wars or Stranger Things or Dishonored or whatever. It's like capturing that performance that people know and love and knows like fans i'm a fan as well but like know so well that you you really have to get it right and if you don't get it right like it just doesn't work straight away so david harbour is such an amazing actor that i could just like i managed to capture it um and i met him at a convention and i had the book yes and he he signed it and he was like super impressed that someone could could do that could like translate his performance because he's one of those he's like he's, he's a He's an actor. But he's, an, he's an actor, actor. Yes. Um, like really intense and puts everything into it. So I kind of hoped I like reflected and did that justice uh, in the book. Um, and it's interesting. He is in the book. He is a partner, um, Rosario Delgado, and she doesn't exist on TV. She's a she's a character for the book. So when you whenever you're writing tie-ins, you've got to create original characters that somehow have to stand up to characters that people already love. So people are reading the book and it's David Harbour and like he's doing his thing in your head. But then there's this other person, Delgado. So this is another challenge of any kind of tie-in. It's like you have to create characters that fit the universe of Stranger Things, that are strong enough to stand next to David Harbour or Jim Hopper um, or Eleven or, you know. Um, so yeah, I think both them, they're obviously they're like a partnership in the book. And yeah, there was such, such fun to write. Awesome. Um, 
sidestepping the easy uh, the easy answer of Lucas, um, I think I would say the character that gave me um, I wouldn't say joy, <laughs> more like that I, I really like being engaged with while I wrote would be Max because, well, I mean, if you've seen season four, you know why. Um, uh, I was like, oh, my baby. Um, <laughs> and I, I think it was because of everyone, right? So at the end of season three, right? You ha I don't know if there's anyone who hasn't seen season three, I'm sorry. Um, but like at the end of season three, there's, you know, being a big disaster and many people have lost people, but... Um, it ends so abruptly and you don't really see Max go through the complicated feelings of losing someone, but also someone you sh would have, you know, prior not cared about losing. Um, and then also having a complicated home life, also being away, you know, with parents who are split, um, being away from the you know, place and culture she grew up in this new small town in the middle of nowhere-ish. Um, a, a party that is now also split up. Um, so like she's in this place at the end of season three where she's like sort of untethered, if that makes sense. Uh, and I really liked sort of unpacking that, like peeling back the layers um, and, and, and trying to dig into how she's feeling and why she responds the way she does. And especially because um, the others don't really recognize it because, you know, they're all teenagers. They're just moving into teenagehood. They're all thinking about starting high school of being cool, of being, you know, reinventing themselves and stuff like that. So, like, no one's really witnessing Max being this person. And, and she, she's sort of dealing with it all alone. Uh, and one of the big things that often appears um, in, in Stranger Things fans' message boards, which I lurked on a lot, um, <laughs> was that people were, you know, thought about why Max and Lucas were always breaking up, right, as he mentioned, um, and why they were already broken up by the time the new season started. And, and so I was, I was, I, I liked sort of leading Max to the point where she, you know, where both of them, like, realized that they actually, or like why that decision is made, right? Um, and how she's like struggling with that as well, right? Having to hurt Lucas in that way, even if she doesn't want to, because she's also hurting. So it was a very emotional experience for her and, and for me writing it because I was thinking about all the trauma she was undergoing um, and how she gets there. Um, I think it makes for very, uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm gonna use here? Not really intense, but more like, it makes for very engaged reading uh, and it made for very engaged writing for me. And so writing this particular book, I think Max was like my favorite character to engage with in that way. I mean, I think for me, like Dustin's always been one of my favorites to see on the show because there's so many times he is the co comic relief and he's just so good at that. So I think getting to pull him out of being more of one of the sidekicks and making him the hero and the main character and seeing how he dealt with that. It was, it was a really fun challenge because it's like, wait, I can't just be the quippy guy. I have to do the thing. Okay. I'm, I'm in charge. Okay, sure. Um, and just getting to see that side of him. Uh, and, you know, we, I think playing off of we, when we see him in the start of season three, he definitely is a little bit more self-assured having come back from camp. So for me, it was kind of like, I didn't want it to be just like, I have a girlfriend. I wanted him to have actually gone through something that really got to see we got to see him grow um and besides that i got to do a, a free comic day short story that had like just a little bit of steve harrington and that was super fun and <laughs> mike is trying to explain D, D to steve and steve is just like <laughs> does he like mike, but you've heard of lord of the rings no <laughs> yeah it was fun i love it uh, so I'm going to ask each of you a question uh, specific to your to your process or your work, um, starting with Jody. Um, you know, as a comic writer, your process is just a little bit different from uh, the other guys here. So do you usually see the sketches of the art before you start on the script? Or is there so many moving pieces that you have to, like, kind of leave that in the editor's hands? How, do, how does that usually work? Uh, generally, at least for the books I do, everything is full script. Um, I don't know how many people are comics fans at Comic-Con, um, but <laughs> there's, sort of, there's sort of two main ways of writing comics. There's what we call full script, which is 
similar to like a movie or TV show script, except it actually breaks things down like page one, panel one, panel two, panel three. And then there's what's known as Marvel method, which is more like you give the artist an outline, maybe divide things up by pages, they draw everything, you get it back and then sort of do the dialogue. And I've, I've done that, but it's not my favorite way to work. And in terms of licensed books, you really want to get like a solid script in so you can get notes on like all the, any details that are wrong, anything that's conflicting with something that's going on in another piece of media or in an upcoming season. So generally, I, I'll do like an outline for the mini series if it's like a four issue book. Um, I'll do a full script for each issue. I'll get notes on that. And then once the art is being drawn, usually you do something called a lettering pass, which is like, you know, if someone's expression doesn't match the thing that they're saying in the script, you tweak it so it, it makes sense. So it's sort of adjusting the writing to match the art. But for, for everything I do, it is script first. That's cool. Uh, so Sui, um, talking about Lucas on the line, it takes place between seasons three and four. Um, and you know, it covers Lucas entering high school, joining the basketball team. So what are some of the things that readers get to discover about Lucas in your book that they might not have seen in season four of the show? Uh, if I was to pick the biggest, um, the biggest one of those, it would be that, um, uh, I know like most, most of like Lucas's, uh, prior to season four, a lot of his um, like notable appearances on, on screen, right? Um, screen time would be like when he's like being badass, you know, like oh, dude, like saving everyone last minute or something. Um, and he's he always like has like perfect responses to things. Um, but every now and then you get this like glimpse of someone who's like a sensitive person who like thinks about things. So just one scene I remember, I, if it it wasn't season two where he like at breakfast or something, he's like asking his father, like, so how do I navigate this situation well, without really saying what, but he was like, how do you deal with when you angry mom? And his dad gives a very quippy response. Um, but like, yeah, he's thinking about things like that and he's processing it. So I was like, that's what I wanted to show more of, right? This person who can be a very sensitive person who can like think, and then it makes sense because you have Max going through this thing and Max is his girlfriend. So that if there's any one person who's going to respond in this way, it will be Lucas. And so I wanted that to be more um, of the Lucas we see. So he's like responding to Max, he's responding to his, you know, new identity as this, new, you know, this new environment of high school. He's responding to like his identity that he's coming to understand as this you know, black boy that exists at this nexus of so many things, of, you know, being a nerd, but also being sort of a jock on the basketball team and all of these things. And, and he's parsing through each, through, through them. Uh, and that requires him to pay more attention to things and to be more attentive and to be more, um, so like less badassery <laughs> and more, um, more sensitivity in a way. And, and that's, I think, takes up, uh, a lot of space in the book and that's a part of Lucas you get to see if you read it. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, so Adam, I want to talk about the structure of Darkness on the Edge of Town. Um, you know, it's built around Hopper basically telling Eleven a story about his past and that's how the book is, is structured. So how did you guys decide on that structure? Like how, what was the thought process? Like how did it come about? That's a good question. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> What does that structure allow you to achieve, I guess? Yeah, so because the book is a prequel six years before season one, um, I wanted to connect it very strongly to what we see on TV, which is kind of difficult if it's a prequel, like that far back. So using the framing device of, of Hopper telling Eleven this story was kind of cool because like, you see it in season two when she's she's going like that room under the floorboards and yeah. there's boxes and one of them's is New York. So there's an immediate connection there for people that remember that scene. And then it was just like, for me, especially in season two, like Hopper and Eleven in the cabin is such a big part of season two that it's um, the kind of perfect way to tell the story. Yeah. And especially because Eleven is becoming at this point, you know, she changes a lot during the series, obviously because she's becoming a person almost. So she's really curious. And the way to link season two and three 
where we see when we see it across all the seasons, but like between seasons two and three, she changes quite a lot. And that kind of curiosity and discovering that the world is actually a bigger place than she knew, and that Hopper, like, had a, a life before he met her. There's all kind of important, like, character themes for Stranger Things, so that was just a way of doing it. And then it was kind of cool, because then you could you could comment on the story in 1977 using Hopper and Eleven in 1984. So it kind of periodically goes back into the, they're stuck in the cabin that's snowing at Christmas time. And, you know, 1977 in New York is kind of a less tough time for the city and it's a really strange time in general. And he's a cop and like New York City Police Department in 1977 was like basically a men's club. Um, and kind of horrible and like even for 1984 standards like dated and Eleven is learning all this stuff about how Hopper had to navigate this kind of world and is kind of shocked and it's a way of commenting on on 1977 and 1984 which for us is that's still 40 years ago so even that is now completely dated um, but it's cool because also Eleven is such a great character and I'm glad that I got to write her because she's I mean she's unique um, and she was the the most difficult to get right because of the way she develops over the series and the, and the way that she acts. And my editor and I got to the point where we were going through season two, her scenes, like minute by minute, counting the syllables of her speech mm. to make sure that we got her pattern right because she had such a particular way of, of speaking, which I think is also um, the actress her performance, like, it's not necessarily in the script. It's how that was translated. Yeah, she does an incredible job with it. Yeah. So it was, it was like, trying to capture that really, like, super accurately, which is unusual, because the normal characters, like, Jim Hopper was like, ah, oh, he's like, he's Hopper, he's David Harbour. <laughs> he's like, he does his stuff. In 1977 and 1984, but 11 was, like, really difficult. But really good way of using that structure to link a completely separate story, but still make it Stranger Things. Yeah, totally. Um, it makes it's, sense. Yeah, it lives on the front cover as well, which is like awesome. And it worked great. Um, so Reginald, uh, you know, Lucas is obviously written from Lucas' point of view, but when narrating for an audiobook, how much do you try to, you know, mimic the voice and manner of the speech from the show versus bringing your own kind of personal flair to the character? And uh, is the same true when you're narrating dialogue for other characters that fans know from the show? Like, how, how does your process typically work? Uh, I was lucky enough to get a really nice, simple directive from the powers that be, and they basically said, do not try to impersonate. I was like, sweet. <laughs> and, they, and then they said, um, just, we want a similar tone. So that gave me a lot of freedom. Um, I felt a great sense of responsibility um, because of all of you fans. Um, I was exhilarated by the challenge. So um, I felt, again, I felt Lucas was the, was the easiest because I, I, know, I know that kid. I was that kid. Um, other characters, I, you know, I didn't have to impersonate, but I, try, I tried to keep, you know, as, uh, tried to stay close you know, to make all of you happy. Um, but then I hadn't seen season four, so there were characters that I came across that um, I didn't know was going to be in season four, Eddie Munson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Steve, the basketball, Steve, you know, who's on the basketball team. Yeah. So um, I was flying loose, you know. I, I, well, I didn't know, I had no idea. So when I saw the first episode, I was like, oh, <laughs> and so when I saw Eddie Munson, I was like, he started talking. I was like, hmm. And so I was like, eh. So I, I got the essence of who he was, but I'm not sure if I was close to, to his his voice. But I think I got Steve, and, that's, and I told Sui early, that's pr primarily because of the way he wrote Steve. So I kind of I kind of tapped into that psyche, so I was, I was happy about that. But um, so no, I, I tried to, I tried to make sure, no impersonation, but I tried to make sure that I tried to, to recreate the essence of the characters that you love, you know, love so well. And I, I hope you, I hope you listen to it. I hope you enjoy it. 
um, and the new characters. I just, I, 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 I just did what I thought felt right, and the writing was 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 my guide. So when I, I most, and this is the first time I actually worked with some a franchise and characters that are already established. Uh, the other books I've done, the Lucky Ones, that's a fictional book. Murder, uh, Silence on Cold River. That's a murder mystery. So these, so I was, so I'm, you have freedom as an audiobook narrator, you have freedom for characters that are, that don't exist, that no one has any prior knowledge of. Um, and the lucky ones, I did, there was an appearance by uh, Robert, no, the, the brother, uh, Bobby Kennedy. Um, yeah, Robert Kennedy. And uh, I, I contacted him, I said, um, guys, uh, I, I, Massachusetts bought, I can't, uh, I'm not sure if I can, because I, I like, don't worry about it. We need for him to sound like the official person, you know, important person he, you know, he is. And I was like, sweet. Mm -hmm. So um, I will put my, what you uh, described as my own personal flair, whatever that, whatever that is, um, for <laughs> fictional characters, so. That's great. Uh, cheers to that. Um, so we have like five minutes. I would love to see if anyone has a couple questions. Anyone in the audience? Yes. <laughs> I think with my book, it was purely coincidental because they, they wouldn't tell me anything at all about what was going on. Um, but I gave Eleven her walkie-talkie in the book. And by coincidence, she has a walkie-talkie at the beginning of season three of um, Strange Things. So they're like, oh, that's great. That kind of works out. And then there's a comic, I think. This is where I love how tie-in kind of all mixes together. In the book, it's Christmas time and Hopper mistakenly buys her Hungry Hungry Hippos, which is a board game, but like she's too old, it's stupid. Mm -hmm. And there's a comic where like she gets it and that was like from my book to the TV show to the comic. Yeah, I think usually they try to make sure as we're coming in that we're as informed as possible without like, you know, knowing too much, but like I got to see and read scripts for seasons three and four early to make sure that the stories I was pitching didn't conflict with things that were coming up. So it was, it's a little bit more the opposite. They want to just make sure like we're staying true to what's happening in the world and we're not like going off in a crazy direction that doesn't make sense. And yeah. Yes. I'd say it's a diff it's a different kind of work process. Um, it feels much more collaborative. Uh, I, I was just telling Adam outside that I remember I remember the meetings more than I remember the writing uh, of that movie because like it, there was a lot of like just tossing stuff up and like shooting stuff down. It felt much more like a writer's room, and I was meeting like many different teams. Um, so yeah, it's different is what I will say, but I think I enjoy the, the idea um, of dipping into another world. It's just, just it's a different kind of challenge uh, and I enjoy it in its own way, um, in, in a different way from creating mine. So I suspect I will continue to do both because they sort of scratch different itches for me creatively at least. Great, I have one more question I think. So what do you got? Uh, that I'm not sure for the TV show. I mean, the way that the both in the show and the comics, they sort of set up like the pre break in and the post break in. The lab looks very different. Like when we see eight and 11 really young, they're like, they don't have the shaved head, they're wearing normal clothes. And, you know, of course, eight has very different powers than 11. So the era of the lab I was writing all predated that scene. So everything sort of took from what we saw there. And then when we see the lab later in 
season four, everything's changed a lot. So I think we're looking at two different eras of the lab. So it kind of really depends if they want to go further back again or if they want to stick with the more recent stuff that's closer to 11 at the age we know. Thank you, everyone. Sorry to cut this short. I mean, this is a great conversation. I appreciate all of you coming. And uh, one last round of applause for our panelists, please.